thank you all so much for joining us for today's program about the Conservation Society of San Antonio, which is part of DCPL's exploration of preservation around the nation this month. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. For those of you new to DCPL, we are Washington, D.C.'s citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that's dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic environment of our nation's capital. I first like to take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Robert Benson Photography, Fire Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, Edens, EHT Traceries, KCE Structural Engineers, Quinn Evans and David Schwarz Architects. So thank you all for your dedication to preservation in DC. So with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker. Okay. Um, Vincent Michael, PhD, is the Executive Director of the Conservation Society of San Antonio and Trustee Emeritus of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, where he was Vice Chair of the Preservation and Sites Committee and the Diversity Task Force. His 37 year career in heritage conservation includes senior position, positions such as chair of the National Council for Preservation Education and John Bryan Chair of Historic Preservation at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where he taught historic preservation for 16 years. A prominent keynote speaker and widely read writer, Vincent has also worked on heritage projects in Asia, South America and Europe. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Vincent and thank you so much again for being here to tell us more about your organization. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. I'm gonna share my screen now. And again, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the Conservation Society of San Antonio is one of the oldest uh, nonprofit preservation organizations in, in the country. Uh, we were founded in 1924 and um, San Antonio itself has a, a preservation history that goes even before that. In 1883, the state of Texas um, purchased this little chapel from the original Alamo Mission, and it was the first public preservation project west of the Mississippi River back in 1883. A couple of women named Adina De Zavala and Claire Driscoll uh, fought to restore the building at the turn of the 20th century, and eventually uh, the Alamo, which looked like this during the famous 1836 battle without its campanulate roof line, uh, became uh, the centerpiece of, of what is really a, a town that is built around preservation and uh, tourism and things like that. So it's really exciting. Our group actually got started not because of the Alamo, nor as many people also popularly believe because of the Riverwalk but because of street widening in the 1920s. And when you widen streets, and I saw this in my years in Chicago as well, basically you just chop the front off buildings. Uh, in this case, you're looking at one building that was actually slid back 16 feet. That's the Commerce Building. They then later added three stories to it and you can still see it today. Uh, street widening was threatening a building called the Market House. Our founders, uh, two women, Emily Edwards and Rena Maverick Green, decided with 11 other women to create an organization that was founded as the San Antonio Conservation Society in March of 1924. They failed in their first effort to save that building. It was demolished, uh, but they quickly began to work on other things. Uh, Emily Edwards had trained in uh, the arts in many places, including Hall House in Chicago, and she made these series of puppets in 1924 of the city council, and they performed a little play in rhyming couplets where Mr. and Mrs. San Antonio argue over the future of the city, whether they should turn their back on their history and their river and their natural beauty or preserve the landmarks that uh, give them so much civic pride. Uh, on the right is our current headquarters building, the 1870 Wolf House, and below is uh, Mission San Jose, the largest of the five San Antonio missions. And indeed the missions became a centerpiece of the Conservation Society's early efforts, um, especially Mission San Jose. Uh, we were also involved in the early effort in 1930 to save a building called the Spanish Governor's Palace, which you see below, uh, which is not really a Spanish Governor's Palace, but it was the uh, uh, in the Presidio, the Plaza de Armas. Uh, we had a typical Law of Indies two plaza uh, downtown system. And it was uh, dramatically, somewhat romantically preserved in 1930 and still there today. 
And then the river itself, which uh, is of course one of San Antonio's most famous features. It's a very meandering river. It takes uh, 13 miles to cover six miles as the crow flies. And uh, that creates the dramatic downtown river bend that we all know and love as the river walk. The river walk uh, was actually designed by a very young architect, 27 year old architect named R.H.H. Hugman. He had been to New Orleans. He thought New Orleans did a great job promoting its French heritage. He thought San Antonio should promote its Spanish heritage. And so he designed the river walk. This is probably the centerpiece Rosita's Bridge in the Arneson River Theater uh, with the amphitheater that looks somewhat natural behind. Uh, Hugman actually designed it in 1929 and brought it to the Conservation Society. They encouraged the city to take a look at it. And it took 10 years uh, because the depression had set on, but it was finally uh, constructed in 1939 to 41 and is still um, the top tourist attraction in town today. At the same time, uh, San Antonio experienced one of the early preservation efforts. This was an area called La Villita, which um, was probably inspired by, you know, sort of uh, Colonial Williamsburg Greenfield Village. Um, and they, it was sort of the old high ground near the low water crossing of the river downtown. And there were a lot of early houses, many dating back possibly as far as about 1810. If you look at the one in the upper right corner, that's where General Martin Perfecte Cost signed the um, surrender to the Texians uh, three months before the Battle of the Alamo. This was preserved um, along with an uh, effort by uh, National Youth Administration to do traditional crafts in a lot of the buildings. Um, and it was a, a very interesting project that combined somewhat, uh, again, romantic era preservation with uh, a youth job training. Uh, and they had a kiln there, they had a textile factory, they had a carpentry, things like that. Built a couple of new buildings. And the city wanted to expand this La Vita idea, but it didn't have enough resources once World War II had started. So the Conservation Society got involved. So we bought this building on the lower left from 1855 called the Deschiel House in 1942. And we still own it. It's currently leased to a restaurant. And then we bought the one at the right, the Otto Bombach House, also dating from the mid 1850s uh, in uh, January of 1950. And we uh, recently bought the one in between the two. So we actually still own those properties and they are leased out. Uh, and they form part of this area called La Vita. Now, interestingly, uh, Maury Maverick, the mayor at the time, when he created La Vita, he, he was quite a character. And he said, La Vita shall not be a uh, museum, uh, shall not be a dead museum for mincing scholars. And he even included in the ordinance an illustration of a mincing scholar that you see here, in case you didn't know what a mincing scholar looked like, and also contrasted them with the young couple doing the jitterbug. Uh, he wanted a lively place. And interestingly, since 1948, uh, our society has hosted its major fundraiser and one of the oldest cultural events in town called A Night in Old San Antonio in La Villita. So it is quote, more jitterbugging than uh, mincing scholarship. Um, this event, uh, which we started in 1948, uh, takes place over four nights, uh, five hours a night, uses 15,000 volunteers, um, and nets us around a million dollars. Um, it's one of the largest preservation fundraisers in the country, uh, and I actually have five full-time staff to work on this one four-day event and a 18,000 square foot warehouse. Our first major preservation project was the restoration of Mission San Jose. San Antonio had five missions, uh, the Alamo being the first. It was originally Mission San Antonio de Valero, uh, created in 1718, moved to its present location in 1724. Uh, Mission San Jose was the next founded in 1720, and it became the largest. It's known as the queen of the missions. It's one of the more elaborate, as you can see by the carving around the front door here, but it also had been in terrible shape. Um, the roof had collapsed sometime in the 19th century. A group of Benedictines from uh, Pennsylvania had unsuccessfully tried to restore part of the complex in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, and eventually, even the bell tower collapsed in 1928. So the building was in terrible shape. The Conservation Society got involved by purchasing the adjacent granary. These missions weren't just religious structures. They were essentially self-contained communities. They had farm fields on the outside. They were irrigated by an acequia system, a gravity-fed water system. They had uh, textile workshops on the inside. The whole idea was to um, basically 
take the indigenous people and turn them into good Spaniards. That included religious language instruction, but also uh, animal husbandry, agriculture, and crafts. So the granary was obviously a very important part of that, and it had lost its roof as well. So the Conservation Society, the ladies of the Conservation Society, and I should, uh, in using that term, point out that the Conservation Society has always had a woman president. Uh, we actually just elected a male third vice president. It might be the first time we've had a male in that position. Um, and it was a women's organization for much of its history exclusively. So they actually purchased the granary, which was difficult. Um, they often had to, because uh, even a woman buying property in the 1920s was, was uh, very difficult, but they purchased and restored the granary and get, actually got involved with um, restoring the mission as well. They encouraged their workers to go over and start working on the mission. And eventually the archdiocese, which owned the mission churches, the four Southern mission churches below the Alamo, agreed that it would finish the restoration and actually restore the building. So you can see it today. Uh, the organization also got involved in um, creating some sort of special status for the San Antonio mission. And in 1941, Mission San Jose, Mission Concepcion, which is uh, the next three were founded in 1731, Mission Concepcion, Mission San Juan, and Mission Espada were uh, made a state historical park in 1941. Uh, they were then made a national historical park in 1978. And when you go to them today, you will see the national park rangers with their smoke of the bear hats. Um, they basically own everything up to the church doors and within the four churches, they are still active uh, Catholic parishes. One of our next preservation projects was the Steve's Homestead, which we uh, was gifted to us in 1952. We actually just recently sold this property. It will be returned to a private home. It's a lovely 1876 Second Empire design uh, that interprets life in the late 19th century. Uh, the family here was part of the uh, what was called Sauerkraut Bend, an area just south of downtown on the San Antonio River that was populated by wealthy Germans. Uh, San Antonio has a long um, uh, German history of German immigrants coming uh, as early as the 1840s. And uh, many of them settling some of our surrounding communities like Bernie, New Brownfeld, uh, Castroville, and, um, Fredericksburg. So Steve's Homestead was interpreted as a house museum for almost 70 years. Uh, we also acquired in 1961 the Atari Edmonds House. This was a adobe brick cottage that had been built by uh, the Atari and Edmonds family. Uh, this had been mission land for Mission Concepcion. It was purchased by Manuel Iturri Castillo in uh, 1824. Uh, the family eventually built the house about 1859. It was a six room adobe house and it has um, uh, been preserved uh, both for its unique construction. We don't have very many adobe or even adobe brick buildings left in town, but also again, to show 19th, late 19th century life. Um, the property also includes a mill, which is a 1970 reconstruction of the mill that was there originally, an 1883 carriage house that was moved to the site in 1964. We also own a few other properties. Uh, the sort of deco looking building is called the Alaskan Palace. Uh, the other one to the right is called the Gresser House. It's also in La Villita. Uh, we don't mean to own a lot of buildings. One of the reasons we recently sold the Steve's Homestead, but we purchased Casa Navarro in 1959 until turning it over to the state 15 years later in 1974. This was significant because this was the home and business of Jose Antonio Navarro, who was one of the few Tejano signers of both the Texas Declaration of Independence and the Texas Constitution. He was born in San Antonio and uh, was one of the few Tejano patriots uh, of that period. Um, we were very pleased uh, five years ago when this became a national historic landmark along with three other Latino American sites. Uh, the Conservationist Society has been involved since the beginning also with parks and open space. Natural beauty uh, has been part of our mission along with uh, historic properties and what we called in 1924 customs that we call them tangible heritage today. So we uh, created the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. That's our big sort of central park here and got involved in many other parks. This is San Pedro Springs Park, which was uh, set aside as a park in 1729. We also got very involved in urban renewal and highways, and in fact, fought the major highway that connects us to the airport in just 15 minutes downtown. 
uh, for years and years and uh, lost uh, some friends in the process. Uh, we were involved in King William where the Steve's Homestead is located, which became the first historic district in Texas in 1967. And in fact, I'm sitting in it right now. Here's some of our lovely buildings, James Campbell Rogers, Kaltire House on the lower right, uh, the Altgeld House from the 1860s on the left, and Alfred Giles' own house, the uh, Folk Victorian Cottage you see on the upper right. Uh, the next historic districts in town were La Vieta, which I've already mentioned, and Monte Vista, which is a lovely area that includes many large homes, uh, about um, 10 minutes north of downtown and about 100 feet up, so slightly cooler. Uh, Hemisphere in 1968 was the first World's Fair in the Southwest. It was also uh, the first World's Fair that didn't demolish everything. They did use urban renewal funds to basically take over 92 acres and demolish most of it. But they actually preserved a couple dozen buildings, which are still there today. Uh, these were preserved as restaurants and other features. So this 1887 or 1877 and 1886 houses are still used today, thanks to that pioneering uh, use of the World's Fair property. I'll be talking about another fair property we're trying to save right now that we uh, have just been involved in. In 1985, I was in Chicago, but I remember vividly on the cover of Preservation News reading about the largest building ever moved to preserve it at that time, moved on rubber tires. A uh, three-story, early 1900s uh, businessman's hotel was moved over six days, six blocks, including a trip across the river, on the bridge, over the river, to its new location, where you can still see it today, with an addition that sets back and... Uh, complements but not mimics the original. Conservation Society also purchased the old Ursuline College, a series of these lovely limestone buildings dating to the mid-19th century in the 1960s. Uh, the Rand Building, which is a lovely Chicago school skyscraper that we owned briefly. And these are properties we owned, put an easement on, and then turned over to another entity. The Aztec Theater, a Vaudeville Movie Palace uh, from 1926. We actually owned it and, uh, for six years and actually showed films and operated it for a while. It's now a live venue. Uh, and we actually even own this little clock, the Hertzberg clock, which we recently restored. It's on the corner of the building that it, the jewelers that it was associated with is long gone. In the 1980s, we got involved in a more diverse approach to preservation, working to preserve Ellis Alley, which is the cradle of African-American civilization on the Near East Side of San Antonio. These buildings were restored in Masonic Lodge, several buildings and repurposed both by local professionals and by our transit agency. Conservation Society for about 60 years has done building grants. We do between 50 and $100,000 worth of grants. They can go to any property 50 years old or more. They're for exterior work, things like porches, uh, window and door restoration, roof lines, things like that. Uh, one of our more significant programs. And as I mentioned before, we do a night in old San Antonio, that term is trademarked. And that's that amazing event that uh, raises a lot of our money. We also, up until COVID, had done heritage education tours where we took about 2,000 sixth graders over the course of two weeks to one mission and one other historic site, like the Aturi Edmonds or the Steve's Homestead or Casa Navarro or the Spanish Governor's Palace. Um, we had to do virtual tours, which you can see on our website, uh, geared towards that same fourth grade audience uh, for the last couple of years. Um, this year, we're probably not going to get back to them yet. They were normally in November, but next year we plan to. The San Antonio Missions in 2015 became World Heritage, and the Conservation Society was, again, the one behind it. Here's talking about never letting go of your mission. We made it a state park in 1941, a national park in 1978, and we led the effort to nominate it. World Heritage beginning in 2006, succeeding in 2015. In only nine years, if you know me, I've got a little bit of a background in World Heritage. In fact, I'm teaching a class on World Heritage Management starting tomorrow night. And I was pretty amazed. I was not here in San Antonio yet when that inscription happened, but it's quite impressive. And uh, part of the reason that uh, these uh, missions got World Heritage was was sort of, you know, really to me, it's about 21st century preservation because it wasn't just about architecture. They're interesting architecturally, but there's nicer missions in um, Bolivia, Peru, California, a lot of places architecturally. The reason is because they had the entire landscape. Not only did you have all five of the missions, including the Alamo, you had two of the Asakia systems, the irrigation systems still working, one of which carried over an aqueduct since 1745 has never stopped working. 
these irrigation systems are still in use. And to top it all off, the people were, were still here. In other words, the indigenous who came in, the Spaniards who settled, um, those people are still with us today. We have many people in San Antonio who can trace their uh, lineage back 12 generations. Um, showing on the right, uh, one of the wonderful projects they've done as part of the annual World Heritage Festival since 2015, called Restored by Light. Uh, the missions were originally elaborately plastered and painted in red, blue, and yellow. And uh, rather than try to awkwardly restore that physically, what they do is train cameras on them to actually restore them by light. One, what They pick one mission each year and do it at night. It's very exciting. Um, the other aspect of 21st century preservation is, of course, cultural heritage. This is a picture of the Monachines. About 60 different Monachines organizations come to Mission Concepcion during the Festival of the Virgin in December uh, to celebrate and dance and song. Um, we called it customs back in 1924, but preserving our cultural heritage and these kind of traditions has become really important. It's become especially important in issues that really came to light about five or six years ago in San Antonio. Uh, the city has a very robust office of historic preservation. At that point, they brought in a cultural historian because we had interesting problems. This was a landmark building. It's called the Mall House. It dates from 1949. It's basically your American graffiti style with tacos uh, drive-in, right? And the amazing thing is it had huge emotional appeal as a place that incredibly important to the people on the West side, which is largely uh, uh, Mexican American part of town. Um, yet this was a place where one could come for 20 or 25 years and have all sorts of important mile markers in your life occur without ever walking in the building, without ever leaving your car. So the importance of the place wasn't in the architecture and they're proposing to demolish it and just restore signs and uh, which is what ended up happening but this led to a series of living heritage symposia that brought in experts from around the world saying how do you deal with intangible heritage with sites that are important but it's uh, that importance that significance does not adhere in the architecture or perhaps even the built environment and that led to the creation actually borrowing from san francisco the legacy business program this is del bravo records on old highway 90 uh, that has enlisted more than 100 uh, local businesses that go way back. So uh, that's been interesting. The other issue that's ongoing is Alamo Plaza itself. Uh, I mentioned the Alamo was saved back in 1883, restored to its present condition sometime around 1912 or so, which includes the old chapel itself, a building called the Long Barrack. Uh, there's a 1940 cenotaph in the center that honors the uh, defenders of the Alamo, basically, they had decided to defend the old Alamo mission. Uh, uh, General Antonio and President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana and his army uh, besieged them for a dozen days in March of uh, 1836 and then overwhelmed and killed all the defenders. Um, we were especially concerned about the three buildings you see on the lower left, the Crockett Palace and Woolworth buildings. Uh, these, uh, the Crockett building had actually been built in 1882 even before the Alamo was saved. Uh, these lay just astride the west wall of the former Alamo. And there had been a lot of effort back starting in 2014 to try to recapture the battlefield. There's sort of a, a conflict here between interpretation too, because uh, very much the focus of the Alamo is on the 1836 Texas Revolution. What happened is all the Alamo defenders were defeated. And then six weeks later, Sam Houston pulled out a victory over Santa Ana at San Jacinto near Houston. Uh, and Texas became its own country for the next nine years until the debt became too much and they joined the United States. Uh, so this has been part of that story. But interestingly, it's world heritage because of its mission history, which lasted for almost 100 years from 1718 to 1794. And of course, a huge city has grown up around it, which arguably was why the Spanish created the missions in the first place. So they brought in a series of international consultants and their first proposal to sort of reclaim the footprint was to build a series of glass walls. And if you've uh, been in, in, in the Texas climate, you realize glass walls are really not a great idea. They might make sense in Northern climates, uh, but down here basically it's 100 degrees every day in the summer and the summer lasts for eight months. So here's the original footprint of the Elmo mission and uh, consequently the battle. And there are five buildings that are on top of what were the original walls. In fact, the walls are long gone. Uh, the buildings on the west side of the plaza that I'm showing on the right 
have 15 foot basements. So all archeological evidence is gone. It's also under a US post office from the 1930s to the north and a hotel building on the uh, Northwest corner. Uh, our concern focused, uh, well, first of all, it's the 21st century. Uh, the idea of having to like maybe tear down buildings so you can reclaim a wall is something that arguably was done back in the 1930s when we were doing romantic preservation. But nowadays you have technology where you can use augmented reality to just show something that's there. In fact, people developed that technology a number of years ago for the Alamo area. The Woolworth Building became our focus um, of this effort, uh, largely because this 1921 Chicago style building uh, was not only architecturally very nice, uh, it's all there, save for the F.W. Woolworth sign, all the, all the rest of the terracotta and brick and windows are there. Um, but what happened here even more significantly on uh, March 16th of 1960, uh, this became the uh, one of seven downtown lunch counters that voluntary, voluntarily and peacefully integrated during the sit-in movement of 1960. Basically, this started a month earlier in, in uh, Greensboro and uh, people, uh, young African-American men and women were going in and sitting in at lunch counters, uh, being refused service and doing a nonviolent protest. Interestingly, in San Antonio, they planned to do that. Um, they planned a big sit-in for Thursday, March 17th. Um, Tuesday, March 15th, the business and religious leaders got together and decided, you know what, we're just gonna integrate all the lunch counters. So there was never a sit-in here. It was unusual uh, and very positive development. It was sparked by a 17-year-old freshman named Mary Lillian Andrews, shown here sitting at the Woolworth Clunch counter in March of 1960. And we formed a coalition uh, back in uh, late 2018, after the Alamo had released plans showing the Woolworth building gone. It was not in the picture at all. And we're like, this is too important. So we partnered with a number of organizations, including San Antonio African-American Community Archive and Museum, uh, San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, uh, Westside Preservation Alliance, uh, Mexican-American Civil Rights Initiative. And we uh, started one of the other, San Antonio has a lot of cool traditions. One of them is we have the largest Martin Luther King Day March in the country with you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And so we, marched in January, 2019, um, trying to save the Woolworth building. We also, in May of 2019, hired local architects at a wonderful discount to draw up our own plans. They said they wanted a new Alamo Museum on that site and uh, they wanted it to be world-class, which they defined as 130,000 square feet. And so we hired some local architects and said, okay, we're gonna remind you, first of all, that you're Mission footprint runs under a bunch of other buildings. And in fact, if you're really concerned about that 1836 battle, you'd be concerned about the buildings to the north because that's where Santa Ana broke through and got in. The West Side didn't really see that kind of action in terms of the battle itself, but they were been able to purchase the building. So it was, as I said to them in 2018, sort of a crime of opportunity. And we said, well, there's no reason you couldn't keep these buildings add 40,000 square feet to them so you get to your magic 130,000 square foot number. And in fact, if you're so worried about seeing where the west wall is, why not uncover it with a tunnel so you can look at it in the shade, because the most important thing in San Antonio climate is shade, rather than out in the open. And we released these drawings in May of 2019. And then a couple of days later, we successfully and somewhat surprisingly secured State Antiquities landmark status for the Woolworth building. Here we are in Austin uh, with many of our partners from the NAACP um, and the other, uh, other African-American community organizations uh, after we succeed in getting that status. So that was, was one of the few ways you can regulate the state of Texas to get the state antiquities landmark status. So that was a very significant development. Later that year, um, during Muertos Fest, like Day of the Dead, we did an ofrenda for Mary Lillian Andrews, got a local artist to donate her time and you can see we've got the uh, Woolworth cornice sort of replicated in Mary Andrews' ofrenda and the lunch counter. So we wanted to interpret this important history of uh, what happened there. And uh, this was part of a number of ofrendas. There was in fact a competition and we won second place, which is awesome because we beat out a Selena thing. And Selena is, is the biggest. So I think this is a short little video. 
Just showing you in detail the ofrenda. Then we elevated the San Antonio Woolworth building to the status of Notre Dame de Paris, Easter Island, and Machu Picchu. Does that seem like ridiculous hyperbole? In late October of 2019, San Antonio Woolworth building became one of World Monuments Fund's 25 World Monument Watch Buildings, World Monuments Watch List. They only do this every two years. There are only three in the United States, and this was one of them. And if you thought my comment about Notre Dame and Machu Picchu was hyperbole, see what Architectural Digest said. It's actually hard to read, but they talk about uh, far-flung icons like East Island and Machu Picchu, plus lesser-known civil rights sites like San Antonio Woolworth, mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, this was in their book showing the famous lunch counter integration of March 16th, 1960. Uh, we leveraged this to do a series of events. We got the county judge to express on, above the fold on the front page that the Woolworth building should be saved. Now that had this status, we got a meeting with the um, general land commissioner in Austin who owns the building. We brought the NAACP along and we created, uh, working with our uh, PR firm who had helped us with the uh, architectural drawing. Uh, we put together a campaign and a watch day where we did a series of events. We brought in scholars. Uh, this is Everett Fly, uh, who spoke about the uh, civil rights history of Alamo Plaza in general. Dr. Tara Dudley, who's a National Register expert from Austin. Uh, we're actually working with her now on another project. Bruce Winders, a former curator of the Alamo. Uh, Todd Moy, who's part of the Black and Brown Project collecting civil rights oral histories uh, between University of North Texas and the other one up there, I can't think of it. And Catherine O'Rourke, who, who brought it all home from our, our local architectural historian from Trinity University. They also had done a study commissioned by John G. Wake's associates. They uh, basically sat on the study for a year, but when they finally released it, the study said, you know what, these buildings are great. You could totally reuse them. Uh, a hurricane wouldn't knock them down and they should be the site of the new museum. So we had really achieved a lot in a couple of years. We held anniversary marches with the NAACP to commemorate the lunch counter integration in March of 2020 and 2021, even during COVID, as you can see. Um, and we did a series of two videos, which you can see on our website that talk about the sit-in movement in Texas in general, and then specifically how it played out in San Antonio with Mary Lilly and Andrews. Um, and I really encourage you to watch those about eight minutes long. They're very good. Um, by 2021, Bear County had committed $25 million to restore these buildings and as part of the Alamo Museum, have a museum that would celebrate the civil rights history. One of the things we learned in the structural report is the Woolworth building of the seven buildings that were in a grid that day and of the six that survived is the only one that had physical evidence on the inside of where the lunch counter was. So that's been really exciting. Plus, you can sort of see it on the right here. I got contacted in early 2021 um, because we hadn't been able to put anyone in the Woolworth building on the day of the integration. And then I was contacted by a biographer of Richard Howland Hunt. Um, I knew him slightly from Chicago. He's the most prolific public sculptor in American history. Uh, and his, he had been posted here as an army, uh, a draftee in the army. Uh, worked as an artist for the Army here at Fort Sam Houston and uh, went to the uh, organizing effort for the sit-ins. And when the, uh, they were integrated, a relatively prominent architect named Allison Peary called him up and drove him down and they had lunch at Woolworth on that day. And I was able to speak to Richard Holler and Hunt. He's still alive. Uh, and uh, he is part of our video as well. So that was very exciting. Um, some of the other things we're working on, we've been trying to preserve this lovely 1877 stone pumping station in Brackenridge Park. Um, we, uh, San Pedro Creek has sort of a cultural park going on that sort of a, a parallel river to the San Antonio River. We continue to work with Hemisphere trying to preserve their historic structures as they develop a new work for it. We uh, had a friend of the court brief uh, to help save the Hay Street Bridge. Uh, this is a 
former railroad bridge that's now a pedestrian and bicycle bridge, but it, it becomes sort of an entryway to the city from the east side, work with a local community to do that. And mid-century modern has become very important to us for many years. Uh, that on the right is the Wood Courthouse. That was originally the Confluence Theater, part of Hemisphere 68. And it's going to be an ongoing preservation challenge, unusual round building. Originally, it had three theaters on the inside that showed this huge movie uh, about America on three screens. And then the walls dropped away during the presentation. The other building we're just working on right now, in fact, just had a press conference uh, less than two weeks ago, is the Institute of Texan Cultures also built for Hemisphere in 68. It's been this repository of the many influences that have come into Texas, uh, obviously from Spain and Mexico, uh, but less well known from places like uh, Germany and uh, the Philippines and China and, and so forth. And uh, the idea of the Institute was that the uh, Society of Texas is molded of all these different cultures. Um, and the Institute itself lost most of its staff. It's owned by the local university, which has basically sort of shut it down almost. And uh, so the question is what will happen to the museum, but more importantly, what will happen to this amazing brutalist building, which uh, takes some getting used to. We also work to save some of the oldest buildings, the Hakales. These are the early Adobe structures. Um, there are only about six or seven left in the entire county. We also led an effort starting in the 80s uh, to um, survey all the historic gas stations. We have a huge amount of gas stations. I actually did a calculation once because a lot of them, including these three, are restaurants now. I did a calculation once that I could uh, bring you to breakfast, lunch, and dinner in San Antonio for a week. That's seven times three, 27, and they'd all be in gas stations and we'd never repeat a place twice. We made a special effort to save this 1935 pure oil gas station uh, down on Nogalitos, uh, which in, ultimately involved the Power of Preservation Foundation after we got some architects to do some drawings showing how it could be restored and the land redeveloped. Uh, eventually got the Power of Preservation Foundation to lease the property from the owners. They put a new roof on it. And say, get involved in a lot of neighborhood issues, um, questions of infield zoning, questions of demolitions in certain many city neighborhoods. Um, and we did a series of neighborhood workshops, basically trying to teach neighbors how to talk to developers, how to talk to the city, how to say something more nuanced than just it's too high, it's too big, it's too dense, uh, but to really propose alternatives. We even turned this into a board game called Plots and Plants, where you're given a million dollars and you have to try to develop something. And you can either take the shortcut and not talk to the community, or you can take the long route, which gives you better odds later at passing uh, the various commissions and city council. Uh, we still have efforts we lose. The lovely 1916 Beacon Hill School came up with some great drawings to show that could be saved and it was demolished. Uh, the G.J. Sutton building demolished by the state almost by surprise one Monday morning two years ago. So it's something we're fighting and it's especially true outside of historic districts. On this map you can see the peach color are the Monte Vista and Tobin Hill historic districts. And you can see once you're outside of the historic district that everything's being demolished. So rampant construction, rampant demolition, we are one of the fastest growing cities in the country. A lot of that is out in sprawl land, but a lot of it's here in our center as well. And we're seeing, as many of you are, a lot of violations where people come in, they get a permit, they do something else, they don't get a permit, things like that. Uh, this got to a point a couple of years ago where we uh, were making about 20 statements a month to the city about all the, the things that were happening. Another exciting project that I'll be briefed on tomorrow uh, is as they work on San Pedro Creek, which is essentially a cultural park, lots of new public art murals and stuff. They found the remains of the 1875 St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church. And we went through a year long process. The cornerstone is still there. A uh, year long process to come up with a good plan to sort of preserve the feel of that space. And this is uh, where we are today. Uh, initially, they were gonna wipe it mostly out and just put up a sign. And fortunately, with the uh, pair of uh, St. James AME itself and, and a lot of other community organizations, it's a much better result. Another interesting project has been the successful listing of the Alzana Apache Courts, an early federal public housing project on the Mexican-American West Side on the National Trust 11 Most Endangered list a couple of years ago, which led almost immediately to the Housing Authority abandoning their plans to demolish and replace them. We also worked with Esperanza Peace and Justice Center and the Westside Preservation Alliance to preserve this interesting, but not necessarily beautiful building that had really a weird history. It was the famous brothel of Fanny Porter, if you've seen 
uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That's where they were hanging out and riding the bicycle. Uh, it then, uh, after uh, 30 years of that, became a uh, nursery and, and orphanage um, for 100 years. Um, and we were working with the groups to nominate it, to have it preserved somehow. The owners didn't want to. It was boarded up. And sadly, in February of this year, it burned down uh, on the coldest night of the year while um, homeless people were uh, camped in it. We had a more successful effort with this beautiful 1912 house, the Hughes House. Uh, this was owned by the Archdiocese of San Antonio. And thanks to Texas law, religious organizations who own property can do basically whatever they want. And um, so it was surrounded by parking lots of local San Antonio College. And the assumption was that they would sell it to the college. So we wrote letters to the college saying, please don't buy it. They wrote us a letter back saying, okay, we won't. And we wrote a letter to the Archdiocese saying, please try to sell it. Maybe someone wants to buy it. Uh, so they did. They put it on the market, put it up for sale. And I was contacted uh, by this woman on the lower right, Mae Chu, said she was interested in buying it. I also had been in contact with a local chef named Andrew Weissman, who was also interested. The two of them teamed up, purchased the property, and will be restoring it, uh, have already done work. So that's really been a, a wonderful story of getting involved. Um, and we even got a nice letter from the Archdiocese after we sent them a letter thanking them for putting it uh, on the market. They sent us a very nice letter back, glad it could be saved. So as I say, our current issue is to try to save the Institute of Texan Cultures. We've partnered with a group of people, many of whom formerly worked there, a lot of whom have PhDs, um, many of whom are important donors to UTSA. And uh, it's really been an exciting group. It's actually brought me in touch, oddly enough, with uh, echoes going back to uh, Chicago. The uh, uh, woman I worked with uh, in Chicago, her, uh, who passed away a number of years ago, her son uh, is now down here in Texas and had joined our effort to help save this building yesterday. So it's very kind of exciting. So um, our next challenge will be in a couple hours, I'll be over at the Alamo. They're planning to reconstruct the South Gate. We have archeological evidence of where the South Gate was. That was significant because it was in the mission, but they also want to recreate this lunette, the sort of uh, this area you see on the lower right there, uh, which was sort of a defensive uh, fortification that existed during the siege of the Alamo in 1835-36. And uh, we think it's kind of overwhelming and a little cartoonish. So we're gonna be meeting with them about that uh, in a couple hours. So. Um, just want to, you know, come back. As we all know, preservation is reuse. I'd also say that preservation is about partnerships, because every one of the things I showed you involved incredible amounts of partnerships, whether it was the missions where you're partnering with the archdiocese, the park service, local community groups, nonprofits, whether it's the Woolworth building where you create a coalition of eight organizations that are working towards a common goal. Um, and and uh, we got an award actually from the N local chapter of the NAACP for our work on that. Very proud of that. So preservation is reused. It's also partnerships. And this is our website. And uh, I didn't use up my hour, so we'll be able to answer some questions. And I can pull them out of the. Well, thank you so much, Vince. That yeah. was an incredible uh, presentation of a lot of incredible work. Um, especially with the Woolworth. Congratulations um, yes. on that victory there. Um, also loved the board game. I've never seen something like that. And that was such an interesting and cool thing you guys have done with that as well. Um, it was really fun. People were laughing when they're playing it. It's like, okay, you're a developer. Here's a million dollars. How do you get through all this? It's yeah, <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, so okay. So let's look at some of these questions. I can read okay, them. So off. San Antonio is in South Texas. Um, I'm about two miles north of the border. I think Laredo would be my closest border town. Um, I'm about two hours from Corpus Christi too. Uh, mm -hmm. Houston is three hours to the, um, and notice we only speak in time, not distance, is three hours to the east. Uh, Dallas and Fort Worth are like four and a half, five hours to the north. So mm -hmm. we're in South Texas. We're actually, um, geologically, we're sort of the East Texas is sort of like cotton. It's sort of like the deep south. And we're the edge of that. Uh, West Texas is like deserts and mesas. And we're kind of the edge of that. And we're also this area called the Hill Country, which is a lot of hills. Think LBJ Ranch. And that's where a lot of the uh, German settlers were. The interior house appears to have a creek running under it. Uh, it's actually uh, a desagüe from the Acequia system. And it is unusual. We get questions about that all the time. 
Um, but that Dasagwe then fed into the mill. The mill was right behind the house. So yes, it was unusual to have it running out of their house. Yes, it would help cool it. Uh, but its most important use was to power the mill. Uh, building materials are common. We have, uh, I've mentioned adobe brick, and I say that's, you know, it's very rare. Adobe and adobe brick are relatively rare. Just a handful of buildings. I can name almost all of them. Um, there is a local limestone that reminds me a lot of uh, the Joliet Lamont limestone from uh, Plains River Valley in Illinois. Um, it's a oolitic limestone with a fair amount of magnesium. There's also a lot of caliche. And if you're familiar with, um, you know, Southeast Asian architecture or South Asian architecture, where you have a lot of laterite, it's a similar thing to laterite. It's basically you cut it out of the earth and it's like clay. And then on contact with the air, it hardens. Um, so if you've been to Angkor Wat, you know, the outer surface is stone, but inside is laterite. And so we have a lot of caliche houses. Those are harder to preserve because they basically have to be covered. You have to have some sort of uh, plaster, lime plaster wash on top of them. Uh, because the caliche is inherently friable. Um, we do have a fair amount of timber. There isn't local timber, but interestingly, I mentioned the Steve Holmes that he opened one of the first lumber yards here. Uh, so they did import it. The railroads got to San Antonio kind of late 1877. Um, and then there's a fair amount of brick as well and you know other typical modern materials. Any other? Um, is San Antonio experiencing special preservation issues due to climate change, such as excessive prolonged heat or flooding rains? Uh, well, certainly we had, uh, I mean, uh, basically here, June and July were 100 every day and there was no rain. Um, so yes, at the same time, that's somewhat, you know, we the climate here is, is you're gonna have uh, five years of drought for two years of non-drought. Mm. So we're in definitely one of the drought years. We live off uh, one of the largest aquifers, the Edwards Aquifer, and there are protections about its recharge zone. It's also something we monitor very carefully um, that connects up toward Austin. Austin is only uh, 70 miles away. That's our closest town. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, no, we're definitely experiencing climate uh, issues here. Um, but they're just sort of an exaggeration of what we've already had. And flooding is an issue. I and mean, there's a flash flooding warning now, it might rain today, so. Hmm. Um, let's see, uh, Karen wants to know, well, she says, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I am a native of San Antonio and learned so much. I also made the connection with many of your preservation projects and being a school kid visiting these structures. Does your organization connecting with, uh, does your organization connect with S AISD for educational programs? Yes, we do. And so the, when we were doing our live heritage education tours, we basically contact all the schools in, in both SAISD. We actually have a number of school districts here. There's also Harlandale Northeast, um, but SAISD is the biggest. Um, and uh, we basically had a revolving schedule of uh, different schools that would be involved. And then we've also, since we've done the online um, heritage education tour videos, we've shared those with SAISD and others. So, uh, and I've done presentations for individual schools. I did one not too long ago about the missions. Wonderful. Um, somebody else wants to know, the National Federation of Tourist Guide Association is having a conference in San Antonio in January, 2023. Will you be there for the uh, post tours after the conference? So we are actually doing what we call, I mentioned our night in old San Antonio. We also do a miniature version of that that doesn't have 12 themed areas after the various ethnic groups that made up the city and a dozen music stages and 160 or 180 food and drink booths. <clears throat> we do a little mini version. We're doing one for that group. It's called the Neocita. And uh, it's a little night in old San Antonio. So we have a smaller area where we have food and drink and music and, and so forth. So yeah, you'll see me. Sounds great. Um, any plans for more preservation on the east side? And is there any specific projects there? Uh, absolutely. There are a couple. There's uh, one house that we've been sort of an advocate for. And oddly enough, our partners haven't been pushing as hard called the Grumbles House, where the NAACP was actually founded in San Antonio. Um, and it's, uh, its roof is off right now, so we're quite worried about that. Uh, so we've been pushing the city to enforce uh, uh, codes on that. It was bought by a sympathetic buyer, but then it 
gotten in worse shape. So that's that's one area of uh, of concern and focus on the east side. Uh, we're also concerned about the west side, the Buena Vista area, which was proposed as a historic district, has some internal uh, dissension against that. Uh, but that area is very vulnerable because the University of Texas San Antonio is going to be dramatically expanding its downtown campus and that near west side area we used, uh, that was known as La Redito, of which Casa Navarro is one of the few remaining buildings, um, is uh, you know could well be threatened by that university expansion. Hmm. Well, definitely everybody check out the website and follow their social media for updates on Yeah, content. please take a look at our city videos. I'm very proud yeah. of how those turned out, especially the one in San Antonio. Really an amazing story. Um, we were, <laughs> uh, after they, they integrated on the Thursday, almost by coincidence, Jackie Robinson was here for a prearranged speech oh. on Saturday. And he was quoted in the New York Times the next morning, Sunday, on page one, saying what San Antonio had done uh, is a story that should be told around the world. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what organization designates landmarks or historic districts? Um, is it citizen driven or can governments initiate actions? It's usually citizen driven. Um, the government can initiate actions. So we have, a, as I mentioned before, we have a robust office of historic preservation. Mm -hmm. uh, many other cities would be jealous because we have a cultural story in there. We have an archaeologist, a full-time archaeologist there. Um, so, for example, with the gas stations, we started that survey. The city then picked it up. We sort of worked together to finish it, and then they proposed the top 30 gas stations as potential landmarks. Mm -hmm. Most of the landmarks we've seen the last few years have come from uh, individuals. Um, uh, some of the historic districts will generally come from the Office of Historic Preservation, but only you're not even going to think about proposing a historic district unless you've got a majority of the uh, homeowners in favor of it. So, yeah. Um, Anne says, thanks for this really fun and informative. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, and another question we have here is um, How do you go about developing a preservation program focused on intangible heritage? as opposed to architecture. Yeah, well, that's a challenge. And that's why we had those symposium where we brought in people to help us do that. Part of it is what a lot of communities are doing today. And we're involved, we're, quite, uh, we're working together with the Office of Historic Preservation um, and doing an African-American historic context statement. So one of the ways to do it is really to step back, uh, do a lot of interviews with people, mm -hmm. oral histories, find out about places that are important, that are important just as places, not mm -hmm. because of what sticks and stones might be there. Um, find out what traditions and sort of themes resonate with various groups um, in terms of intangible heritage. Um, so whether it's you know music, songs, costume, foods, things like that. Um, uh, basically, you know, in the old days, the way you did a survey is you drove around and said, "Oh, that looks cool." <laughs> And maybe you did a little historic research first so you could keep your eye out for the home of that famous person. You know, mm -hmm. now it's 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 backloaded the other way. You've got to do all that sort of research and outreach before you ever walk down the street. Yeah. I think your point uh, at the end of your presentation about like how important partnerships are, I think that's yeah. right. It kind of helps out initiatives like this a lot. So yeah, that was huge with the Woolworth building, because in a sense, you know, um, and then I think for any preservation group, mm -hmm. you know, if you can walk into a room and say, well, I'm a preservation group, somebody in power can say, well, you're on the margins. But if you walk in and say, I'm a preservation group, and here's the NAACP, and here's a local community development organization, and here's a uh, Latino uh, community empowerment organization, they can't close the door at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important to have those partnerships and collaborations. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, is your organization, do they offer university classes or real estate uh, continuing education credits? No, but we should. That's a great idea. I, I, as I said, I do teach. There is a nice preservation program here at University of Texas San Antonio. Mm -hmm. They've been doing a class in, in world heritage management. Um, and I know a lot of the faculty there. In fact, one of our former presidents of the Conservation Society is, is one of the regular faculty there. Yeah. Um, Karen also says um, that 
they see more seniors involved than younger people. Do you see that, you know, on your side? And like, is there anything you guys are doing over there to try to get younger folks more involved, I guess? <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny because I've been around so long. And I'm one of the old folks now. And uh, this has been a problem since I was a young folk. Um, yeah, that is a challenge. We have a group called Junior Associates, mm. which are younger people that do various projects. It's a relatively small group, though. Um, and but at least it's something and we've had it for like 60 years. I mean, I could I could show you a former mayor who used to be part of our junior associates group. Um, and so that's, you know, one way to try to do it. Um, the other challenge you have in general, um, I'm also I'm involved in some even older organizations here. Um, is uh, volunteerism. San Antonio is an incredible town, as you can tell, with 15,000 volunteers in San Antonio. Incredible in town for uh, people just volunteer tons of their time to do a lot of things. Uh, but that seems to be generationally challenged as well. So we see a lot of our volunteers getting older and the other organizations I'm involved with, they're even older. Um, they have the sort of the same issue and we get very precious about those six guys that are, you know, 39 years old. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would say it's definitely a, a challenge, but uh, fortunately, you know, I think most people here have a consciousness of the centrality of landmarks. When people think of San Antonio, they think of the Alamo, they think of the Riverwalk, then they might think of the missions. Well, all of those are huge preservation projects. So uh, we are sort of defined by preservation in a way that, you know, Austin and Houston aren't really. Right. Yeah, we've been doing uh, a lot of outreach to like local universities and stuff and trying to get um, like emerging professionals into the preservation yeah. kind of field as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the students are one of the better groups. I mean, because uh, we do have UTSA as a Hispanic, uh, Latino Hispanic serving institution. And mm -hmm. um, many of them come from the Valley, the Rio Grande Valley. And uh, they're very involved thanks to the preservation program, the architecture and engineering programs. Um, That's great. And we, we get them out there to do stuff. That's great. Um, let me see. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, do you have a substantial donor base? I guess they mean like private donations or how else is, do you guys get support, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, so we, I mean, like everyone else, we put in grants. Um, yeah. uh, we have uh, what we call uh, the Capital Club. This is sort of, um, I think what Landmark Hill might call it the Skyline Council. It's sort of the donors giving you five hundred or dollars or more a year, and you do a few special events, behind the scenes tours, et cetera, for them during the year. So we've got that group that was started back in two thousand eight. So that's got some significant donors to it. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we uh, lease properties, but um, the single largest source of our income is that one four day event. You know, probably. Um, a more than a third of the annual income. So uh, it's something we need to do better. And while San Antonio is a great town to find volunteers, it's not a great town to find large checkbooks. So we're, we, you know, um, people will <laughs> gladly stay up all night cooking brisket for you and give it away the next day, but. Right. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, is there anything else? Um, I mean, besides like the website and everything else that we close today, like any other sort of things you'd like to plug, upcoming events, webinars, maybe? Or anything? Yeah, we're going to do, um, we're going to have, uh, we got a wonderful donor, speaking of significant donors, to endow a permanent, uh, a regular lecture uh, named after one of our founders, uh, Amanda Cartwright Taylor. Uh, it's her grandson, and he actually just passed away, but before he did, he uh, created this Amanda Cartwright Taylor Distinguished Lecture. And so we're going to have David Vela do uh, a Latino's history in our national parks. David Vela is from Texas. He's from the small town of Wharton. He began his national park career in the San Antonio Missions National Park and eventually became the acting director of the entire national park system uh, before retiring about a year ago. So he's going to come speak. Uh, which is great. He was also one of the keynotes at the Latinos and Heritage Preservation Conference in Denver earlier this year. So we're that's coming up September 14th. It's free to the public. It's at the McNay Art Museum here in San Antonio. Uh, it's a Wednesday night. So uh, that's a very significant event coming up. All right. Well, that sounds amazing. And I, I, I put the uh, website and um, social media handle again for the, San, uh, the Conservation Society of San Antonio back into the chat. I'll have it in the email 
follow Great. up with you. I'll have that as well. Um, and thank you so much again, Vince. It was amazing to learn more about your organization. Well, amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you all of you for inviting me. Uh, really glad to uh, uh, tell everyone about what we're doing way down here in South Texas. Well, it's amazing work. And um, I'm looking forward to visiting sometime to see all of it in person. So Please do. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for attending. And we'll see you next time. Thank you again, Vince. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.